Good morning, church. Aren't you glad to be in the Lord's house this morning? Amen. Would you stand with us as we turn everything we have towards our Heavenly Father this morning? Two, three. Angels we have heard this morning, church. Amen. You may be seated. It's Lord's Day in December 2021 as we're celebrating Christmas and God's goodness to us. And so we're just so glad to have you here. If you are a guest here with us in person, online, if you're in person, there is a little blue card there in your uh, pew rack, and we just ask you to give us a name, phone number, email address. You can drop it in one of the boxes. We're not going to really pound you or hound you, but we would just want to say thank you, and we will donate five dollars in honor of you to our local Joy Clinic. It's a ministry here in our area that ministers to people who do not have health insurance or dental insurance, and they'll help them out. But most of all, share the love of Jesus and the gospel with them. So we're just so glad to have you here this morning. Uh, and again, if you're online, you can just go to our website, click on About Us, and then under there, under there contact us, the same thing. And so we're just so glad to have you here today, and uh, here we're here to worship and praise the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let me just give you a couple announcements very quickly. Tonight we do have the uh, uh, Children's Choir Christmas Musical at 6, 6 p.m. tonight, so you don't want to miss that, 6 p.m. tonight. Uh, if some of you can kind of hang around after the service, some of the guys can hang around after service. They just need to get set up. It won't take, I don't think, too long, just about maybe five, ten minutes. If you can help, they would appreciate that. Also, uh, we'll be doing Operation Christmas Cookie this week. If you still want to make some cookies, you can drop them off uh, first thing in the morning when the office opens. But I do want to say thank you all. And I know another group, uh, another life group, will be making cookies this afternoon. And again, thank you all so much because it's just going to be a way we can go touch a lot of people this week and share the love of Jesus with them. And so, again, thank you all so much uh, for your faithfulness uh, and your faithfulness to serve. And so we do praise, praise the Lord for you. 
All right, let's go Lord in prayer. And uh, Brother Taylor, would you open us today in prayer? Amen. Would you stand with this church? <laughs> This morning, church, honor him. Amen. Mary, did you know it's your baby? Your baby boy has come to make you new. This child that you deliver will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby Did you know that 
your baby boy has walked where angels run. And when you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again. The lame Praises of the Lamb. Oh, Mary, did you know it's your baby boy, Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know it's your baby boy, one day rule the nation? Did you know it's your baby boy? Heaven's perfect land. This sleeping child that you're holding is the great I I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out, working all things out. Yes, I
church, you may be seated. Good. Uh, sorry about that. Forgot I turned it off. Now we're back on. Uh, so, back up for those on uh, on the internet. But basically, Larry King, like I said, they asked him one question: If you can interview anybody across history, he said, "Who would you interview?" He said, "Jesus Christ." And he said, "I would like to ask him if he was indeed virgin born, because the answer to that would change all of history." And as we talked about last week, it does change all of history. The virgin birth is the hinge point of everything. Now, what does the Christian church believe? Let me just give you a couple of creeds. The Nicene Creed, which was adopted by the Council of Nicaea in A.D. 325. It was a long time ago. Not long after 
uh, the New Testament Church of Gun, said this, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, who for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. The Osberg Confession, which was the first Protestant confession in 1530, said, Of the Son of God, also they teach that the Word, that is the Son of God, did assume the human nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Southern Baptists in their Baptist Faith and Message 2000 says, Christ the eternal Son of God. In his incarnation as Christ Jesus, as Jesus Christ, he was conceived uh, of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus perfectly revealed and did the will of God, taking upon himself human nature and with his demands and necessities and identifying himself completely with mankind, yet without sin. And so today I want to talk to you about the focus on the incarnation. And the incarnation means God came in the flesh. God became man. See, that's the foundation of Christianity. It's the foundation of Christmas. If God did not come in the flesh, hey, there's no reason to be here. And so today, I want to talk to you about focus on the incarnation. We're going to be in a couple texts out of Matthew and Luke. Just to remind you, last week we talked about how the virgin birth is the hinge point of all history. It changes the calendar. It changes everything for life. Today, the take-home truth is this. Jesus was born at a definite time in history and at a definite place on earth. He was born at a definite time in history and at a definite place on earth. And so we're going to be in Matthew 2, we're going to be in Luke 2, and we're going to look at these two accounts of the birth of Jesus. Let's look at Matthew's first, and then we'll read Luke's account also. He says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born? King of the Jews. For we saw his star at its rising, and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Christ would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Now, Luke, let's move to Luke's account, chapter 2, verses 1, and we're going to look at several verses, but let's look at verse 7. Verse it says, In those days, days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. The first registration took while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth, and laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And so we see this, this nativity scene. We see this birthplace. We see God coming in the flesh. We see the birth of Jesus here. And the question you've got to ask yourself is, do you really believe this? I mean, again, I think it goes back. Everything hinges on, if you don't believe in the virgin birth, there's no reason to believe anything else. Because, I mean, this is key. Everything hinges on this. So, Dad, I want to give you four evidences that focus on the incarnation, how God became flesh, and how he fulfilled Old Testament prophecy here. We're going to look at some more Old Testament prophecy. How he fulfilled that in him coming. Number one is this. Jesus fulfills the prophecy of the Bethlehem. He fulfills the prophecy. Because, again... Herod is asking, where's the Messiah going to be born? 
And they told him. In Bethlehem of Judea. Now, how would have they known that? Well, Micah prophesied it 700 years before then. And so look at what Micah 5, 2 says. It says, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origins are from antiquity and from the ancient times, from the very beginning. And so Micah here prophesies, hey, hey, the Messiah is going to come. He's going to come, the son of David. And all this was planned before the foundation of the world. Now, what's amazing is you're like, hey, do people in the Old Testament, the, do they really believe that? Yeah, they believe the Messiah was coming and going to be born in Bethlehem. If you study r rabbinic Jewish commentators, they believe this text refers to the Messiah that is coming. Now, what is that Bethlehem Ephrathah? Basically means Bethlehem, the land of Judah. Basically, they were saying that to, the, to distinguish it from the Bethlehem that was in Galilee. In the meantime, we might put a little something on the end of a city or something, or, or we say there's more than one Dublin, right? So we would say Dublin, Georgia. So you would know where you're talking about. Same here in this text is what's going on. And so Israel had been waiting on this Messiah. This had been prophesied. He prophesied this 700 years before. And so Joseph and Mary come to Bethlehem, to the city of Bethlehem. Now, why couldn't they just register in Nazareth? Some people might ask that question. Why, why didn't they just, couldn't they just register in Nazareth? Well, he had to come to Bethlehem because he was in David's lineage, but his ancestral rights were there. And apparently he probably had some property rights. Wherever he had ancestral property rights, you had to go register at that time. And so Joseph comes through the line of David. Now, just to kind of give you an indication how far they came, Bethlehem was five miles from Jerusalem. But Nazareth was an 85-mile journey from Bethlehem. So here's Joseph. He did not have an airplane. He didn't have an Uber. He didn't have his own vehicle. Mary's pregnant. And they made an 85-mile journey. Now, you get the picture. You ladies would not want to make an 85-mile journey pregnant. I don't care what part of the pregnancy. But God's hand is on this. God brings them there. Why? Inter interesting fact here. Bethlehem is known as what? means house of bread. And what the amazing thing that's going to happen is the bread of life was born in the house of bread. Jesus is the bread of life, and he is born in the house of bread. See, Jesus was born at the appropriate time, at a designated place. Galatians 4.4 4 says he, he came at the fulfillment of time. At the completed time, he came. Why was this time so perfect? Well, number one, there was worldwide peace, which was known as Pax Romana. Do we have worldwide peace now? <laughs> Shoot, we're not anywhere close to that. At that time, they had an excellent road system that people could get around. There was one main language, Koinonia Greek, so the gospel spread through it. See, the truth is, Jesus came at this time because this is a time that they had set up in the very beginning of time. You see, God is an on-time God. He orchestrated all these events to happen so that Jesus could be born in Bethlehem that would fulfill the prophecy of Micah. But you've got to understand, Jesus existed long before the manger. <laughs> he was there in, in the beginning. <laughs> he was there in the beginning. But what's amazing is Jesus was talking to some people uh, in John 7, 42, and he says, asking this question, doesn't the Scripture say that the Messiah comes from David's seed and from the town of Bethlehem where David lived? See, on that silent night, the Son of God tiptoed in this world, unseen by everybody, but was born in Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy that had been prophesied 700 years before 
Jesus came to fulfill that. What's the second prophecy he comes to fulfill? Second evidence of his incarnation is this. Jesus fulfills the prophecy of the star. Now the wise men talk about this star in Matthew 2 and, and how it pointed to the, to the king of the Jews, the Messiah. And, and, and these wise men link the star to the king of the Jews. Now, how did that happen? How did they come? These are wise men, probably from Babylon area. How did they, how did they link that up? How did they know that that star represented the Messiah? Something to think about. The wise men, you need to understand, were not there when Jesus was born. Somewhere closely, about two years. How many wise men were there? Don't say three because it doesn't say that. How many gifts were there? Three. That's why you see three wise men. But the text doesn't say how many wise men came. So it could have been multitudes. We don't know. Say, how did they know? Because these, these magi, these wise men, were the priestly class of the Medes and the Persians at that time. How did they know? Let me give you an example reason I think they know. Remember Daniel? Where did he live? Babylon. When did he go there? Early teenager. You remember when he interpreted the dream of Nebuchadnezzar? Correctly? What did Nebuchadnezzar, who did he put him over? He put him over all the magicians, the Medians, the Chaldeans, the diviners, and all the wise people there. Daniel was known as a well-known prophet of the East. This is what I think happened. Daniel discipled these people in the Word of God and discipled them in the Hebrew Bible how one day there is a Messiah coming. Because if you read Daniel 9, 24 through 25, it talks about, he talks about in the 77s, which refer to the 70 sabbatical years, which equals 490 years. And so I think that had been passed down. He told them, hey, the Messiah is coming in 490 years. And I think that was passed down. See, Jesus, by him being born, actually fulfills Daniel's prophecy here in Daniel 9. Because Daniel prophesied, hey, the Messiah, the Son of Man, is coming and told them when they were coming. I think these men had been passed down and they'd been told that there's going to be a star, there's going to be a Messiah coming around this time. And these wise men did, got everything they could, however many there were, and made a 600-mile journey to see. We want to see who this king of the Jews is, this one that's been prophesied, who's the Messiah, the great deliverer, the one who's going to bring salvation. We want to we see that one. When the Jewish people, the Jewish leaders, wouldn't even travel six miles to go see him. But did you notice what they said here? They referred to it as his star. Referring to Jesus, that's, that's his star. Now where did that maybe come from? I think Matthew may be alluding here to Numbers 24 when Balaam is speaking. It says here, I see him, but not now. I perceive him, but not near. A star will come from where? Jacob. And a scepter will arise from Israel, and he will smash the forehead of Moab and strike down all the Shethites. I really do think here, Balaam, who was actually an astrologer of from Bethar, which actually was a city in the area which would become Babylon years down the road, I think he's saying, hey, hey, there's going to be a star coming. And he's going to come from Jacob, and you need to wake up, and you need to see him. Even astronomers at that time, and even astronomers after that, you can read German astronomers and others, they really do think, how did this happen? Some of them think a couple of planets or two or three planets came into constellation just perfectly to form that star. I don't know, but I think God put the star there, and he can put it whatever way he wants to. I mean, he could align Jupiter and Saturn up just perfectly and made it to where the star was, could be that. But these wise men knew that, hey, there was going to be a supernatural light, and it was going to point to the Messiah. Yes, his birth, 
is something amazing. That star was something amazing. And it pointed to Jesus. But it fulfills, I think, the prophecy that we see in the Old Testament. Let me give you a third evidence of his incarnation. Jesus fulfills the prophecy of being the king of Jews. He fulfills the prophecy of being the king of Jews. Now, if you go back to verse 6 here in Matthew 2, he says, You, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. And the last part he says here, Because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Now, that part, Matthew pulls from 2 Samuel 5.2. And look at what it says. And this is the Lord speaking to David. He says, Even while Saul was king over you, you were the one who led us out to battle and brought us back. But look at this. The Lord also said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will be ruler over Israel. I think Matthew adds this language here. To show that, hey, Jesus is the one fulfilling the promises that were given to David that say, hey, someone is going to be in your line king forever. And who's that going to be? Jesus. He was the one born in Bethlehem. He is the Messiah. He's the one that came to fulfill all the promises. He's going to shepherd people just like David did. See, Jesus came to be our king. He came to be our shepherd. He came to fulfill the covenant. Now, does everybody, does everybody believe in him back then? No. Does everybody believe in today? No. But listen to what John says in chapter 1, verse 10 through 12. He says, He was in the world, and the world was created through him. And yet the world did not recognize him. And he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. He came to his own people. Most of them didn't even receive him. So praise the Lord for verse 12. He says, But all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be the children of God to those who believe in his name. See, Jesus came to be king and ruler. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is ruler. He is Lord. He is God. <laughs> and he came to fulfill the prophecy of the Old Testament. And he came to be that for you and I. He came to shepherd our lives if you and I will give our lives to him. And so he fulfills this prophecy. He fulfills the prophecy of Bethlehem. He fulfills the prophecy of the star. I think he fulfills this prophecy here saying, man, I'm going to be shepherd and ruler over my people. I'm going to be shepherd and ruler over Israel. But number four, the fourth evidence of his incarnation is this. Jesus fulfills the prophecy of being the Messiah. He fulfills the prophecy of being the Messiah. Now let's go back to Luke chapter 2. And we'll finish up this, well, we're going to finish most of it up. We'll look at the last few verses of Luke 2 here. But let's look at the rest of this text. It says, in the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then what? An angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. For look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth, the people he favors. Now, who gets the word here? Shepherds. Now, you need to understand, if you don't understand culture back then, shepherds uh, were about on the same level as tax collectors. <laughs> they were at the bottom of the rung. Uh, nobody liked them. Nobody cared about them. Now, what's amazing is many believe that these shepherds uh, watched over the temple flock. Now, what would they have been doing? They would have watched over the flocks for what? The Passover. And of all the sacrifices. Who was being born? Who, just, who was just born in Bethlehem? The Lamb of God. The Passover Lamb. 
And here these shepherds are. They would have been the ones that watched over the lambs many times, possibly for the Passover. And so we have here Joseph and Mary. They've come. They've had their baby. Now they it's lying in a manger. Not to burst your bubble here, but you need to understand they weren't in a manger like you and I think about. More than likely, tradition holds, if you go back to even early 2nd century, uh, where they were, Jesus was born was in a cave. Many times their houses were built up next to, to the rock, and there would be a little cave where they would put their livestock. He wasn't born in some little wooden manger that many times we make. You need to understand, they didn't have the wood like that. And so he was born here in this cave. But the thing is, even though that's where he was born, he was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And it's a time to praise God. It says what in verse 10? The angel told him, hey, I've got what? Bad news? He's got what? i got good news of great joy. And don't miss this. For who? Some people? All people. So that's a great thing there. Uh, what? A Savior has been born. The, the Messiah that we've been waiting for for 700 years has been born. The one that Isaiah and Micah prophesied has been born. Now you need to understand, Jesus was not another, just some little other baby. He was Lord. He was God. Now what does the word Lord mean? It means He's God, He's Master, He's Boss. He left heaven and became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what John 1.14 says. That word there, dwelt, means tabernacle. He literally came and pitched his tent on planet Earth. Was born at a definite time in a definite place. And that package, the greatest gift of all time came, was a package of deity wrapped in humanity. Why? So that we might have eternal life. See, this gift is available to anybody. <laughs> That's the good part. It's available to anybody. How can, how can this gift be available to me? Well, you've got to come to a place and realize that, hey, Jesus just didn't come to be born in a manger. Ultimately, he went to the cross to pay for your sin debt so that you might have eternal life. So how does that become mine? How do I receive this gift of Christmas? Well, one, you've got to believe. I think you've got to believe that Jesus is God, born in the flesh. You also have to believe that you are a sinner like the rest of us. That's why he came. And because of our sins, we cannot earn our way to heaven because God is a holy God and we're sinners. We can't make it on our own. That's why God sent his son, praise God. So we don't have to live in our sins. So how does that become mine? You've got to come to a place where you turn from your sins and say, Lord, I've been going the wrong way. I've been thinking it's all about me. And you realize why Jesus came and why he went to the cross and how he defeated death, hell, and the grave. When he rose from the grave and you come to a place and you say, hey, man, I'm ready to follow you. How does that happen? You put your faith in him and say, Lord, I'm ready to follow you. I'm tired of going my way. Does that mean you live a perfect life? No. That means you put all your trust. You hitch your trailer to God. And allow Him to lead your life. That's salvation. You're hitching your trailer to God. And say, alright God, now you're my Lord and now you're my God. See, before we come to know God, we're the trailer and the truck trying to drive it wherever we want to. And most of the time we drive it into the ditch on a fast track to hell. But man, once you hitch your trailer to God, man, he's giving you a fast track to heaven. And now you have the joy of God, you have the, his peace, you have his mercy. See, that's what Christmas is about. He is the fulfillment of the gospel. He's the long-awaited Messiah that was promised in Genesis 3 that came here in Matthew and Luke 
Those in the Old Testament were looking to Him. You and I look back to Him. He is our only hope today. He is the only hope for our country. He's the only hope for our world. That's why we got to understand everything hinges on this. As C.S. Lewis said, the Son of God became a man that we might become what? Sons of God and daughters. Why? So that we might be his sons and daughters, that we might live for him, that we might just not get wrapped up in just the commercialism, as Caleb prayed, that we might just get wrapped up in all the glitter. May we realize why God put us on earth so that we might come to know him and live for him. And may we learn from these shepherds. I want to give you three fast points of application here that just pull from these, these shepherds as we look at this Christmas story in his incarnation. Let's read the rest here, 15 through 18 in Luke 2. Again, the angels come, speak to the shepherds. Again, you got to think, that had to blow their mind away. Ain't nobody coming out to speak to shepherds. Here's the angel of the Lord. It says, When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to where? Bethlehem. And see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message that they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Let me give you three essential applications I see out of these shepherds that we need to learn. Number one, obey the word of God. Now, did you notice said the angel spoke and then left. They didn't guide them. They didn't give them GPS coordinates in their Waze app. They just did what? Accepted the message. Message received. And then what? Reacted in faith. They left their sheep. That was their livelihood there. Don't miss that. That's just like when Peter, James, and John left their fishing business. That was lucrative. These shepherds here just left everything to go see the Christ child in the manger. They didn't go in order to believe. They went because they believed. They went, that's a big difference there. They didn't go in order to believe. They already believed the word. That's faith. They believed it before even seeing it. That is faith. And they felt compelled to act upon it. That's obedience. See, many times God gives us the word and then we want to argue with God. <laughs> Are you sure, God? Let me throw out 20 fleas like Gideon and try to make sure this is what you say to do. Now, many times God already gives us the word. We just are to act upon it. But many times we don't act upon it. And we miss it. And we miss God's, God's word. Come in, come in. And uh, so many times they, they miss the word of God. Okay? And so... But these shepherds didn't miss the word of God. Man, they obeyed the word of God. I mean, they went instantly and did what the angels had told them. And so that's key. They obeyed. What are we challenged to do this Christmas? Obey the word of God. So what's God calling you to do? Ask him. He'll tell you. Many times he tells us right here. Okay, If you just read the word of God, he'll tell you many times. Obey the word of God. Number two, worship the Lord Jesus. Worship the Lord Jesus. 
Man, they came and did what? They adored the babe, the Christ child, the Messiah. They left everything and went to praise God. They didn't stop anywhere. They went straight to the manger, I believe, to worship the Lord Jesus. If you study, we didn't read the text because just we're in such big text today. But if you go and read the wise men, what did they do when they saw the Christ child? They worshipped him. They bowed on their knees and worshipped him. Why did they do that? I think they realized that this was the Messiah. This was the promised one. This was God in the flesh who had been prophesied 700 years before. And what's amazing is, again, God, God just likes using... That's what I like about the Bible. Is many times we think God would choose this person. You know, God's going to use... Um, I'm not going to choose any names. But, you know, God would use these athletes or these people because they are so famous and seem to have their life all in order. But who does God choose? Just the opposite. He chooses a bunch of rough, gruff, smelly shepherds. To be his choir. To come praise the Christ child. What are we to do this Christmas? Worship the Lord. Carve out some time. Worship the Lord. Be in the Lord's house. But, I mean, that's just, that's just a small chunk of change of your time. During the week, find some time. Worship the Lord. However you want to. Listen to Christmas music, worship music, whatever you you so desire, but find time to worship Him. Uh, You're like, Brad, you just don't understand my schedule. Just understand we're all in the same boat, and you've got a busy schedule. We all have busy schedules. You don't have any more time than I do, and I don't have any more time than you do. Right? So let's worship the Lord. Worship Him this. So obey Him. But third that I see the, the shepherds do is this. They share about the Lord Jesus. They obey the Lord Jesus. They worship the Lord Jesus. And they share about the Lord Jesus. They went and did what? Told others. And what did it say? The people were what? Man, they were amazed. They were like, the shepherds are sharing this? They're, they're sharing about this? That means if God can use sh- these shepherds, He can use us. I don't know about you, and it would be nice to have the YouTube video of this, of them seeing the, the angels come and sing, and then them going to see the, the Christ child, and then them leaving there and sharing with us. It would be a pretty amazing video, I think. Because I would say they were probably, their faces were being about as bright as that poinsettia. Because they'd been in the presence of God. They'd actually gotten to see the Messiah. Not kings and queens. They weren't the first to hear the gospel. A bunch of shepherds. A ragtag bunch of shepherds were the first ambassadors who were to go tell it on the mountain. Again, King Herod wasn't there. The high priest wasn't there. Just a bunch of shepherds that were there. And so Christmas ought to be a reminder to us. I think God, again, I think God put this in the calendar for us and that we might remember, man, we need to obey God. We need to worship the Lord this Christmas. But share about Him. It's like, Brent, I'm not a great witness. Share how He you changed your life. 
or say, hey, have you ever contemplated how the virgin birth is the hinge point of everything? So you need to understand, no incarnation, there's no virgin birth then. If there's no virgin birth, then there's no Savior. If there's no incarnation, there's no need for poinsettias. If there's no incarnation, no virgin birth, there's no need for Christmas wreaths. There's no need for Christmas lights. There's no need for Christmas cookies. So I can't fathom it all. Well, Martin Luther said, The mystery of the humanity of Christ, that he sunk himself into our flesh, is beyond all human understanding. That's where your faith comes in. You have to believe that God sent his son. He created us all in his own image so that we might be able to come to know him. Two verses of poem. Mary had the little lamb said this. Mary had the little lamb who lived before his birth. Self-existent son of God from heaven he came to earth. That's incarnation. Mary had the little lamb in yonder stall. See him. Virgin born, son of God, to save us from the fall. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus was born in a definite time and a definite place. Why? To fulfill all the 351 prophecies of the Old Testament. And only Jesus could do that. Jesus Messiah is living in the flesh. God in the flesh is the incarnation. That's foundational to Christianity. That's foundational to Christmas. So this Christmas, let's be like shepherds. Focus on his incarnation, but let's obey him, worship him, and share him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just do come to you. And Lord, we do thank you that you did come and you dwelt among us in the flesh. You were born of a virgin. You were born sinless so that we might have eternal life. Whether you're in person, online, doesn't matter. The question I would ask you is, have you received the good news of Christmas? Have you received the good news of Christ? Or have you rejected it? Like Brad, I've never received that. Well, I've got good news. You can receive it right now. Whether you're in person, online, it doesn't matter. If you're ready to surrender and follow Jesus, you can do it right now. You said, do I have to join a church, be dunked in some water? No, that's not what it's about. It's about you surrendering and putting your faith and trust in Jesus as I said earlier, you hooking your trailer, your hitch and your trailer to God and following him. If you're ready to do that, I invite you to cry out to God. You're like, Brad, I don't even know what to say. Well, maybe pray this prayer with me in your heart. If you're by yourself, pray it out loud. But if, you're by, if you mean it, pray it. If you don't, don't waste your breath. But if you're ready to follow him, say, Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've blown it, broken your laws. But God, I really do believe that you sent your son to be born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for my sins, was buried in the tomb, but rose again on the third day. And he's alive and living today. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart right now Forgive me of all my sins. Be my Lord, Master, and Savior from this moment on. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, calling me to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. All eyes closed, nobody looking around. Anybody maybe pray that prayer with me if you did this morning. Just kind of raise your hand. I'd like to rejoice with you and pray. The Lord, anybody. If you're online, amen. Thank you all for raising your hand. Praise the Lord.
anybody else, that's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life, giving your life to Christ. If you're online, just let us know. We'd love to get, get with you. But Lord, let me pray for every Christ follower. Lord, I pray that we may not get so busy that we forget the season and the reason for it. Lord, may we adore and worship you. Lord, may we have opportunities to tell others why you did come. And Lord, I pray that you might give us opportunities to do that this week, and especially as we pass out these Christmas cookies. Lord, may you give us opportunities to point people to you, Lord, the real meaning for Christmas. And so, Lord, we love you and we do praise you. And we give you this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're just going to have a time of invitation, just a time to respond to God. You may want to come and pray. Maybe you've got a burden. Just come, and you may just want to come and lay it at the altar. Maybe you've given your life to Christ. We'd love to pray with you and encourage you. Or maybe you're like, hey, I still don't know about this Jesus thing. I'm still trying to wrestle with this. We've got many people here who'd love to share with you uh, how Jesus has changed their lives. And so I'm going to ask you to stand. Uh, Brother Sam and the band is going to lead us. Altars are open. You do what God tells you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing love, now flowing. Hands and feet that were nailed to the tree. His grace slows down and covers me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing love, now flowing from hands and that were nailed to the tree as grace slows down and covers me it covers me it covers me it covers me Amazing love, now flowing down. Our lives the minute we trust Him and give our lives to Him. Let me just remind you, uh, 6 o'clock tonight, uh, don't miss it. Kids will be singing. Uh, they'll be doing their Christmas music. I'll say, well, it's just a Christmas music. Just some kids singing. Well, if that's all you trust God for, then that'll be about all you get. But I have seen people get saved at children's Christmas music. I've seen a 72-year-old faithful church member get saved. So come pray that God would use those kids to speak into people's lives. Invite people. And you may have already invited people. You may already have family members that will come here tonight. And you know that's the only way they're going to come. Let's pray and trust God tonight might be tonight and have faith that God wants to save somebody and let's pray for that why not why not won't that big a big faith boost for our kids why not pray for that 
so that they learn that God can move if we'll pray. Amen? Let us stand. Church. Thank you, Brother Brad. <laughs> Megan, do you have all four verses to Angels We Have? All four. All right. Angels we have heard on us Sweetly singing o'er the plain And the mountains in reply And go back their joyous strain Go Sunday church.